This is Bob Rourke with Business Leaders Podcast, and today on the show we have Crystal McDonough. She is the founder and owner of McDonough Law. They do business law, energy, natural resources, and utilities. They serve Colorado, Wyoming, Nebraska, Montana, Idaho, California, and Florida. Crystal, welcome to the show. Thank you. Crystal, tell us a little bit about your business and who you serve. Uh, Well, we serve clients who are looking for attorneys who can help navigate them through some of their tough legal issues, whether it's business, natural resources, energy, or even trust and estates. Uh, We help our clients navigate those issues. We come up with a plan to walk them through that, and then we implement that plan to help them find as much success as they can with their situations. So... You know, it's, it's, you and I go back a little ways. We've, we've talked off and on for quite some time. And this is not your straight out of college first pursuit. You've nope. been an entrepreneur and a business owner for many years before you pursued your law degree. Let's, let's dig in a little <laughs> bit to the backstory. Okay, you're right. Um, I, I got my first taste in business when I was seven years old. I made uh, inventions out of trash in our trash can, wrapped it in tin foil, and went door to door selling my inventions to our neighbors for a quarter. Came home with a pocket full of change, felt pretty good about myself. And uh, then later on in high school, I started uh, a piano studio. I had been studying piano for a lot of years, and my piano teacher said, "I think you're ready to to I think you're ready to start teaching." So. I opened up a studio and I taught music for a lot of years. That was uh, And what booming metropolis was this in? (laughs) This was in Grand Lake, Colorado, (laughs) little bitty mountain town, if you're familiar with it. And then, you know, went from there. Um, When I was in high school, I discovered that there was not a swim program for our community, for all the kids. So I coordinated with our local country club and uh, coordinated with the uh, the community center in our community and I went and learned how to be a swim instructor took all the the courses through the um, Red Cross and developed and implemented a huge program that they ran for several years uh, through the program and I taught all the lessons I ran the program I coordinated everything I got my real first taste in how to run and manage things and take something from the ground up solve the problem and put a plan together and and find some success with that. And there was a lot of kids that came through our program. It was really, really fun. Then I went to college and... What did you study in college? <laughs> well, I studied piano performance in college. So that was my, that was my first love, was piano. And uh, then uh, I met my husband and fell in love with him, got married and, and went on to uh, continue with uh, other areas of business. We had a small construction business for a while. Um, I maintained my piano studio because I loved teaching. Uh, we had a few other small businesses that we, we ran, uh, but I always loved education. I always loved learning. So I, can, I was the forever student. I was always taking classes and I ended up with a lot of degrees. <laughs> and my husband finally looked at me one day and he said, is there an end to this? I, I mean, are we just going to you know, is there a purpose to all of this education? And um, I finally ended up in a class um, at uh, the University of Northern Colorado in Greeley. And my professor looked at me and he said, have you ever thought about law? You would be really good at law. And I just dismissed it because I thought, oh, I'd have to take the LSATs and then I'd have to take the bar exam and none of that sounds any fun. So uh, I enjoyed business, I enjoyed what we were doing. but I continued to take education classes, and I ended up in a master's program at DU in environmental policy, and our first class was taught by Ved Nanda uh, in conjunction with the law school, and it was global energy law, and I loved it. After our first class, I came home and I told my husband, I have to go to law school, this is so cool. And he looked at me and he said, what? <laughs> I don't even know what this means, but we'll figure it out. And we did. We figured it out. Two years later, I was enrolled and attending the University of Wyoming, and I was pursuing uh, my my JD and my master's degree in natural resources uh, at the same time. So I did a, a dual program. I also had a really unique experience because I was able to work 
um, as a graduate assistant for the School of Energy Resources. So I had this really cool program where I was getting my law degree, working in law, getting my master's in natural resources, and then working on these really great, amazing energy projects for the School of Energy Resources. And it's not like you didn't have a family along the way. No, I started law school with three kiddos. So they were, uh, our youngest was three at the time I started law school. So that was, that was quite the challenge. <laughs> uh, you know, if anybody ever told me how hard it was going to be to do that program with kids and I don't know if I would have done it because it was it was hard. It was it's the hardest thing I've ever done. Ever. You know, and, and the thing that I think is interesting is you know Ian is not on the show with us, and that's your husband. Yeah. And Ian was really stepped into the breach and was really supportive. Oh yeah, my and, husband was the rock that got us through. I mean, he really, you know, he he managed the family, he took care of the kids, so I could do it. I did the whole program in two and a half years, and it's typically a four year program. So I was on a mission to get it done and get it done as quickly as I could because, you know, I had a life, I had family, we had things, you know, we, we had to put everything on hold while I was in school. And he, he kept everything running and uh, could not have done it without him. And my mom, my mom came and helped every other week. She would come help him out with cooking and laundry and dishes. And I mean, it was really a family effort. You know, for, for when you look back at that time frame yeah. and you see your kids <laughs> now, when you have a discussion, mm -hmm. how much, do you think of that effort and drive from example did mm -hmm. your kids pick up? Oh, it's had a huge influence on my kids. You know, for the first few years I felt pretty bad because it was it was hard on them too. They didn't get to see me very much. I'd never been away from them before. Um, I cried every day. and <laughs> um, But we got through it and now my two oldest, uh, my, my son is 18 and my middle is 16 and our youngest is 13. And the, the two older ones, and even the younger one, but the two older ones remember a lot more about it. And they are, they're so motivated. And they even, they even talk about those experiences helping to shape who they want to be and where they want to go in their life. And uh, my 16-year-old daughter uh, told me about a year ago, she pulled me aside and she had to write a paper for, for school. And she said, Mom, you're my hero. Boy, that talk about a, a moment <laughs> that was pretty special because you know you you never really know how your kids are going to see you or what they pick up yeah and I tell you what they are just amazing they're hard working they're passionate about what they want to do um, they're both taking college classes and getting A's of course um, <laughs> but you know it's it's been great because we've taught them and they've, they've learned through this process mm -hmm. how to think for themselves and how to, um, how to be who they're meant to be. And they've seen me work really hard to do something I'm excited about and passionate about. And you guys homeschool too, right? We do. Yep. And so, you know, the, the thing <laughs> that I think is unique about that is you guys have a fairly unique lifestyle. We do. Because yeah. you're seasonal. <laughs> so, you know, when I went to law school, I, I knew I'm a business owner first. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm passionate about business. I love business. And um, I think that's partly why we have so many amazing business clients, because when I get to talking to our, our clients, you know, I'm not only am I talking to them as a lawyer, I'm, I'm also a business owner. I, I get it. I get what they're going through day to day. And um, so it, when I went to law school, the perp, you know, I knew I was I was going to own my own firm. That was the goal, and I knew that I wanted to um, build that firm around my family so that I could have time with them. And I didn't want to be that that parent that was locked in my office from sun up to sundown and never got a chance to see my kids. So on purpose, we set it up so that we could have that flexibility, so that I could work hard, but then I could spend my off time with my kids. And, um, and so you guys escaped the winners. Well, so we started homeschooling. That was mm -hmm. kind of the first plan is, is uh, after law school, we started homeschooling the kids. And, and we had some help. Um, and my husband helped. And you know, it was kind of a team effort there. Um, and the kids just took to it like ducks in water. I mean, they love it. And they love the freedom and the flexibility. 
And then we decided we wanted our kids to experience, you know, as much as we could. And we wanted them to see a lot of stuff, not just study and read about it. We wanted them to see it. So we bought an RV, a fifth wheel, and uh, pulled it behind our truck. And we started taking the kids on trips. We'd go to museums. We'd go to uh, national parks. We'd, we just started traveling all over the country to take them to see some of the history. And uh, everybody still talks about our trip to D.C. We road tripped to D.C. and we were there for two weeks. Uh, walked all over that town, <laughs> and, and but you know it's it's fa- it's great. We've been coast to coast, north south, east west. We've been all over this country, and um, so it, it's been a really fantastic experience for our kids. Um, but I think some of our favorite places are going down to Florida. We do love going to Florida. We like the beach, and um, especially when it starts getting a little bit cold in Colorado. You and, like this morning. <laughs> <laughs> little ice and snow coming in. There was a little ice and snow on my way in over the pass. And um, uh, so we start getting the itch to go to Florida once it starts getting cold. You know, I, I think as, as you know, people are listening and going like, holy smokes, you know, I, that's a pretty large bite mm-hmm. or a meal to eat in one bite. Mm-hmm. You know, as, as you got through law school and so on and you forayed into starting your own firm, what are the key takeaways that you would advise somebody else that's getting ready to do something similar? The number one thing I think anybody needs to do, whether they're in law, business, or anything, is what do they want out of life? What's, what, is the, what do they want out of their life? And then design their life around that. I'm actually writing a book on that right now because I... In your spare time. In my spare time, I am... Um, because, but I, I really believe that, that I think too many people go to work every day because that's what they think they're supposed to do. And, and maybe they have this dream that they'd love to pursue something else, or they'd like to start their own firm, or they want to start their own business, but they're just not really sure how to do it, or, or what the next step is, or how do I get from A to B? I mean, that's, that's really the hardest part, is taking that step. And from my perspective, the first thing you need to do is okay, so what's the goal? What do I really want to get out of this? My goal was I only have my kids for a short time. Once they go off to college, they get their own jobs, they start their own families, you know, my time with them is limited. So I wanted to maximize as much time with my kids as I could. So my husband and I started dreaming up, okay, what are the, what are ways we could do that? How could we, and there is no better way to spend time with your family than in a camper. Because it is a small place, and when you're all crammed together for a month in a little camper... kind of got to get along. You have to get along. And you get to know each other really well. Yeah. And you get really close. Those are my, my favorite memories. And our kids, too. The first time we went out on a camper for the month-long trip, oh, it, we had to take them kicking and screaming. They did not want to be gone for a month. They didn't want to be away from their friends. They didn't want to be away from all other activities. But we got them out on the road, and this just amazing thing happened. All of a sudden... Everybody was just having a blast, and we were laughing together. And nobody was on their phones. Nobody was on their gaming devices. And, you know, we weren't watching TV at night. We were playing games and laughing and having fun or going outside and doing activities. So, really, I think the first thing anyone who wants to do what I've done or what, you know, other people are doing, find out what your passion is. Figure out what the end game is and work your way backward from there. You know, it's, it's interesting, and, and we were talking about it before the show, that you're starting to have people reaching out to you that are in mm-hmm. the law profession going, I want to have my life similar to yours. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get phone calls and emails and LinkedIn messages and Facebook messages all the time from other attorneys who are, they, they love the law. They love helping people because really that's, if you're in law, you have a passion to help people because that's what we do. But they also want to have a life and be with their family. And law can be all-consuming. It can because you're you're solving other people's problems. So that can be, you know, that sometimes that can be very time consuming being involved in that. So how do you balance that and still be passionate and help people, but at the same time be with your pre- your family and be present for them? So the challenge is coming up with that plan on how you're gonna navigate that. So you know, it's not always perfect. 
but <laughs> it's a learning experience. It's always a learning experience, but that's the best part. You get to walk through it together. Well, you know, the thing that I think is interesting is when you look at the broad range of areas that you you serve, you know, energy, natural resources, and utilities, and most recently, or soon to come, you're talking about blockchain as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe we talk a little bit about how you develop the interest and expertise in those various sectors. Well, I think it, first of all, comes down to being passionate about learning. Um, I think that's the key because law is constantly changing, technology is constantly changing. I mean, that's what we're seeing right now in blockchain. Um, we're seeing blockchain being implemented in business, banking, finance, law. Anywhere there's a contract. Anywhere there's a contract, it can be implemented. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we're seeing a lot of changes happening right now. And I think the, the key is, is you've got to just be a lifelong learner. Yeah, and then your master's degree mm -hmm. is in the natural resource space, correct? Yes. Yep. So my master's degree is in natural resources. And so um, I'm passionate about the land. My grandfather was a farmer. And, uh, in Nebraska. So I grew up spending a lot of my weekends and holidays and summers on the farm, helping out with harvest, um, shearing sheep, and, you know. <laughs> Tell your fingers still. <laughs> yep, calving season. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I grew up with that. I grew mm -hmm. up around all of that. So I'm really passionate about that. And, um, and I grew up in the mountains, uh, just a stone's throw from Rocky Mountain National Park. I grew up in Grand Lake. It's about as close as you can get. <laughs> And so I grew up with just a deep appreciation for our natural resources and the world around us. And um, I love working with landowners and, and I love working with uh, people who are doing projects that are related to our land and our natural resources, such as water, uh, wind and solar, oil and gas. Um, we, you know, we do a lot of that kind of work related to the land. You know, and we, we deal with other land issues that, like, like easements, or um, even disputes between landowners, because let's just face it. Um, <laughs> good fences don't always make good neighbors. <laughs> nope, and sometimes the fence is in the wrong place. Yeah, there's the problem. <laughs> so it, it, it really makes for a, a fascinating practice for me because I get to do what I love every day. You know, I, I think about just the, the business of owning land. Mm -hmm. You know, it sounds for folks that don't either own land or don't own ag, you know, you think, well, you own a piece of ground. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's not that simple. Because you have the water rights, you have mineral rights, mm -hmm. you know, you have easement for access or mm -hmm. easement across, mm -hmm. or any number of items which, you know, for you, you have more of an appreciation from your legacy and how you grew up. Yeah. You know, and, and you were involved also in some some unique activities in Wyoming that I think that was in the utility space, wasn't it? Yeah, so when I was um, in my law program, in my master's program, and working as a uh, um, for the School of Energy Resources as a graduate assistant, I was assigned to work and do research for the Wind Energy Task Force um, for the Wyoming Legislature, which was really fascinating because here I was just a law student and I was doing all this research on a lot of really big emerging issues related to renewable energy and land use and that kind of thing. So I did a lot of research. I wrote reports and gave presentations to the legislative uh, body. It was really a, a unique experience, especially for a law student to really get to see firsthand, first of all, how our laws are made, and second of all, how much work goes into trying to prepare laws that make sense related to our natural resources and our energy resources. So it's, it's a unique balance between landowners and energy development. And that's the, that's the balance there. Um, but we do, you know, we do both. We work in both spaces. And um, it really was a shaping experience for me because I got to talk to a lot of landowners. Uh, I got to work with a lot of energy companies and utility companies. And uh, it really was a unique experience. I loved it. You know, I, I think people, when they drive by a big ag operation and they see mm -hmm. power lines going across or they see wind turbines mm -hmm. on there, and I don't know how many people think about the whole process that goes into mm -hmm. permitting and easements and getting to build and the whole infrastructure issue, mm -hmm. you know, to, to get that stuff installed unless you have experience like you or mm -hmm. you're in a landowner that you've been approached. Well, if you think about it, a, a large landowner, a rancher or a farmer, they're probably, you're right, they're going to have all of these areas, they're going to have water, they're going to have oil and gas issues, they're going to have transmission lines 
possibly pipelines. Uh, they're going to have um, maybe other utility easements, maybe telephone. They're going to have uh, road easements. They're going to have uh, maybe even some leasing issues, and sometimes it might even touch on federal. Maybe they're leasing ground from the state or from the federal government. I mean, landowners seem to kind of touch a lot of areas that, you, that we probably don't realize as we're driving down the road. No, until, until you've kind of been down that road a little mm -hmm. bit yourself, yeah. you don't appreciate it as well as, you know, if you just own a house in the city, you don't really think too much about it, mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. You know, unless you have a homeowners association, then they'll tell you what color you can paint your house. <laughs> and and we get some of that too. Mm -hmm. You know, and so it's, yeah. it's just, you know, it's trying to live in society and, yeah. you know, and so for you, you know, shifting gears a little bit. So you came out of law school yeah. and you decided to build your practice mm -hmm. and somewhere along, somewhere along the way, the entrepreneurial spirit really kicked in, in your law <laughs> practice. Because how many folks do you have in your practice now? So we have, um, I think we've got 10 folks in our firm okay. between attorneys and support staff and admin staff. We've got about 10 of us now. And you started out licensed just in what, where you could serve Colorado and Wyoming? No, I actually took, t I took Wyoming and Colorado bar exams back to back. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that was a challenge. I, I think... I think that I'm the only one that took both exams back to back and passed the first time on both exams at the same time. Uh, on, on just on, during that exam period, you know, they, mm -hmm. they have two exam periods a year. But for that, that time that I took the exam during that term, I think I was the only one that passed them both the first time. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had to, I did uh, study for Wyoming and Colorado at the same time. And so I had, I, what I basically, the only way I could figure out how to do it was I, I hand wrote all of the laws for Colorado that I need to know. And then un, I would, as I was studying each of them, then I would put the differences between Wyoming and Colorado underneath each one. So I'd have Colorado and then I'd have Wyoming, Colorado and then Wyoming for every law. That was the only way I could do it. And I, I think I studied about 16 hours a day. I, it, was, it was a grueling couple of months, but it paid off. So you know, when, when, when you look, you know, as you're doing your day to day or getting ready for a court case mm -hmm. and you look back to that period, how much of that experience did you bring forward into running your business? Well, you know, it's interesting because in law, they law school, they don't teach you how to run a business. They don't really mm -hmm. teach you the business of law. In law school, they teach you the theory of law. They teach you, they don't even really teach you how to practice law. They teach you the theory of it. Mm -hmm. And then you get out there and you've got to find mentors to help you apply that theory to the practical aspect. For me, I had a different experience because I came into law school with, you know, we, we owned rental homes. We had already owned multiple businesses. We'd been in businesses where we had regulatory oversight. So I had a lot of experiences that I went in with, um, you know, and, and then just the experiences on my grandfather's farm. Um, my grandpa... I, I loved the farm, so he he showed me how he did all of his leasing, how he did easements. He was showing me the practical side of the farm, um, and my dad worked for Northern Colorado Water, and which was kind of cool growing up because he worked at the far pumping plant there in in Granby, on the lake. And uh, when I was a kid, he used to take my sister and I down, you know, into the plant, and we could could see how everything worked and the practical side of how our water was being used and pumping like you know pumping to the other side for water supply issues and then you know downstream the Colorado River and um, and then also for electricity so I had all these really cool experiences and knowledge going into law school and plus it helped you know I had a family so I had all of that life experience that I took in with me so when I came out of law school, I was able to really apply the theory of law to all the practical experience that I had, especially on the business and the natural resources side. Um, it, it, it clicked for me. It made a lot of sense, and I was able to hit the ground running. So, you know, but on the business side, they don't teach you that. So fortunately, with my business background, um, I was able to, to really take my firm apply that to my firm and treat it like a business uh, because really law is a service business. 
we serve our clients. We provide a service to our clients. That's all we are. And it's a, it's a highly skilled service, but we provide a service nonetheless. And that's how I approach it. I approach our clients from the perspective of, you know, we're here to serve them and we're here to n help them navigate those issues that they've got uh, to the best abilities that we can. I mean, we're not really any different than a car mechanic. So a car mechanic has a specialized skill set and they're serving their clients fixing cars. We're serving our clients, helping them fix their legal situations. So, you know, I, I think about too, and as, as you're going along, you're also trying to innovate within the law field mm -hmm. on, on how you price services as well. Mm -hmm. We do. We are pretty creative. We, we try to be creative with our, our services and how we approach those. So we offer flat rates on a lot of our services. Um, we offer some, some you know, options related to how we approach our services. And we also have a subscription plan that we've just launched this summer uh, to help our clients especially with the business maintenance side, uh, because businesses need constant maintenance. Businesses need a lot of attention. It doesn't matter whether you're a single entrepreneur or whether you own a company with a couple hundred employees. The, the, the business side, the legal side of your business needs to be maintained. And so we've started a subscription service to help our clients manage their businesses on the legal side and manage the cost too. So that it's a it's a it's a monthly fee, a managed cost, so they can budget what they need, mm -hmm. and they can approach their legal services from a little more practical perspective rather than um, you know approaching it from a crisis management because that's really what we want to avoid. Well, I think about if you have an equipment fleet, right? You have preventative mm -hmm. maintenance that you pull on all your equipment, right. so so you don't blow a tranny or whatever you do. And I don't think very many people adopt the same mindset mm -hmm. on basically doing preventative maintenance on your legal structure and yeah. legal requirements. Well, and, and that's the other thing. We, we've also started a new unique service where we come in and do legal audits on companies. And that has been, that's been so great. It's been really rewarding from, from my side because we're coming in to businesses that, that maybe they don't even know what legal maintenance they're supposed to do. A lot of times they just don't, you know. As an entrepreneur, you, you start your company and you get in there and your goal from day one is just to bring in enough money to cover the basics. You want to cover the budget, you want to cover payroll, you want to cover your expenses. So your goal every day is just to hit the ground moving. You're, you're trying to get in clients, you're trying to, to get your product out. And the, the legal maintenance side of your company is usually the furthest thing from your mind until there's a problem. And then we're dealing with crisis management instead of trying to maintain things, you know. And I, you're right, you, you can talk about it from a, a managing a, a fleet of vehicles or even from our, our personal health. We go to the doctor, we go for regular checkups. We want to make sure we're healthy. We want to catch something before it becomes a problem. That's how I want to approach law for our businesses. So we want to make sure that we can manage those issues and we don't get stuck. You know, I, I think too, for a lot of the business owners that are out there, you know, when when they get to the stage of life where they're looking at selling their business. Mm -hmm. And so they've got the sale process. The, the, the potential buyer is going to look at their business from how do I de-risk the business? Do they have policy and procedure? Did they do all the, the legal work inside? So I think from you guys' perspective, when you're working with the business owner mm -hmm. and you come in and do the stress test, mm -hmm. uh, I think the business owner doesn't really realize the value that adds to the company if it goes to sell. Oh yeah, we've dealt, you know, we do mergers and acquisitions as well. And we do a lot of um, planning, succession planning with our businesses. And so it doesn't really matter whether you're looking at bringing your son or daughter into the business or whether you're looking to sell it outside. Somebody's going to inherit whatever problems are in the business. So yeah. <laughs> it's, it's always better to know up front what they are and fix them. And if you can fix them, sometimes you can increase the value of your company which is a huge benefit. If you're looking to sell outside to you know, another entity, why wouldn't you? They're gonna look. They're gonna look, and, and they do their due diligence. And, you know, and we get called on that due diligence often during a merger process or an acquisition. Uh, we'll get called in the middle of it, and uh, you know, the, it, one of the parties or one of our clients will say, um, during the due diligence, you know, this came up, can you fix it? 
Well, it always is a huger hassle to fix it after the fact rather than to get it done when it needs to be done. So, yeah, it's a negotiating point from the acquirer's standpoint when they're yeah. looking that I found a problem you didn't identify. Yep. And then they go, well, what else is there out there? Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think for you, um, you know, people go, well, what does your normal day look like? How do you manage your day? Well, I'm a business owner first and a lawyer second. So the way I manage my day, the first thing I do is I get up and I, the first thing I do is I look at my clients. What's your typical get up time? Um, <laughs> I like to sleep. I'm not an early riser, <laughs> but I'll stay up super late. And <laughs> so I'm usually up by about seven. Mm-hmm. And first thing I do is check my phone. Probably like most business owners, I check my phone and I'm checking my emails. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking to see, okay, who who needs me first this morning? So I'm kind of looking at whatever emergencies are coming in first thing. And I try to tackle the emergencies first. And then the next thing I do is I go straight to, uh, and I I get up and I just go straight to my office. It's kind of my routine. I take my coffee and and I'm I'm working. But um, uh, then I focus on my clients. I focus on what client work we have. I want to make sure that our clients are getting taken care of. And and then after that, I focus typically in the afternoon on the business side, uh, depending on what our client needs are. But the, the business, um, our clients, we don't have a business without our clients. So my focus, my primary focus is always on our clients first. How, what do you do to manage all the various staff and attorneys within your organization? We've implemented some great technology to help us keep tabs on what we're doing and how we're how we're doing everything. So uh, I've got a great IT person that's come in and, and kind of revolutionized our back office. And um, we stay, because none of us are in the same offices. We have an office in Loveland, which is where we are today. And then we've got an office in Lakewood, one in Granby, and one in Casper, Wyoming. And so our attorneys are scattered all over the place as well as our staff. So we've implemented um, a messaging system internally in our in our firm uh, with video and chat capabilities so that we can always be in front of each other if we need each other we're available and it's nice the video is nice because we can see each other we can still be face to face even though we're miles apart so that's really helped us to stay connected uh, and to help us work together uh, with our clients on all their needs you know I think as you, and you, the goal is to have a larger firm across the country yep you know, and I think about, you were mentioning experience from this weekend. You had this group, mm-hmm. uh, lawyers for... Hiking lawyers. Hiking lawyers. <laughs> and it wasn't about fees. Nope. <laughs> nope. And, and, you know, so I, I think about it, and people go, are you kidding? And so for you, even in the off time, mm-hmm. you're out learning further. Yeah, I think I'm probably like most entrepreneurs. It's hard to turn our brains off. So I'm always thinking, I'm always reading, I'm always researching, I'm always learning, I'm always talking to people, I'm always networking, I'm always looking to how we can do things better, whether that's in our practice and how we help our clients or whether that's personally or in our business. Um, I'm, always, I'm always looking to see what, what I can do to improve me and the firm. So. What's, you know, for you, a book that comes to mind that you've read recently that you might recommend that you found valuable? Um, probably Don Miller, uh, story brand that I I've listened. I do a lot of audio books because I drive a lot back and forth to different, uh, offices and client meetings and such. So I think I've listened to that book three times now. Um, that was really great. I really liked that book. It was, it was really cool to, just to hear somebody else talk about how to frame our messaging so that we can, you know, we can get our message in front of the clients who need us. You know, it's, it's, I happen to like the book too. You and I <laughs> both read the book. And, you know, you, you think about, you know, story is a main mechanism for transmitting knowledge. Mm-hmm. You know, and as you work with clients, they're telling you their story as well. Right. You know, um, looking back through your story somewhere in the past, either a failure at the time or maybe it was felt like a failure at the time that you brought forward that's made you successful now. Mm-hmm. Anything come to mind? You know, I think I think through this whole process there've been 
there have been a lot of obstacles and challenges to overcome. And I don't ever look at them as a failure. I look at them as an opportunity for me to learn something new. And I think that's kind of how I've, I think that's how I've approached everything because in my mind, failure is not an option. It's never been an option. There's just obstacles to overcome. You know, I, I think about that. And for the, for the parents out there that have younger kids, they go, mm-hmm. well, what kind of Petri dish did she grow up in? <laughs> you, you know, how, do you, how can folks, parents, yeah. try to instill in their children the mindset that you have? What do you think your parents did that was helpful? Well, actually, I think I can pinpoint it back to something that my dad did when I was um, looking at maybe starting my piano studio. He sat me down and he said, okay, well, we're going to do this the right way. And he had owned, he, he was a mechanic, mm-hmm. and before he worked uh, for Northern Colorado, he was a, a mechanic um, working out of a truck, and, you know, that's how he put food on the table for us. So he had, he had a really good understanding of what the service industry was and how to really serve people and serve clients and, and, and help people. So he sat me down. He said, all right, we're going to do this right. You're going to pay taxes. You're going to keep track of all your books. And you're going to make sure you're taking care of your clients. And so he's kind of sat me down and in this, you know, got me a little notebook out. And he said, this is how we're going to keep track of everything. And granted, it was a, a very small business. I was only 15. But we, we set it up. We met with this, the accountant. And we set up my books. And we set up, you know, a structure mm-hmm. for my little business which probably didn't need a super big structure. It might not have even needed any structure because it was so small, but, uh, but we set it up as an entity and we got it set up and I was paying taxes every year and I was 15. <laughs> so it was kind of a unique, um, I think that that really gave me my first taste as to what you could, what you could do. And surprisingly, my little studio grew while I was in high school, in fact, um, my daughter, we, we've since moved back to Granby, and my daughter is working at a little fabric store up there. And she's my mini me. She looks a lot like me. <laughs> so she's been working there with these just wonderful ladies. And people from the community have come in and said, I think I know your mom. And a few of them have come in and said, Your mom taught our daughter piano lessons. And <laughs> so you just never know where your reach is going to go. You know, for you, as, as you think about business, so you had the early part of business, right? Yeah. Doing books, paying taxes, getting organized. Yeah. And at some point, you have a business, then you go, I have to grow my business. Mm-hmm. So what were the influences that have allowed you to grow your business from where you started after law school to now? Um, well, one of, one, of the, one of my big influences was the former governor of Wyoming, Dave Friedenthal. Um, Governor Friedenthal was a huge influence and mentor for me. Uh, The last year of law school and and my first year of practice, he took a lot of time to visit with me and give me advice and mentor me. And um, I, that, I'll never forget that. That I'll always be grateful for. I also had a really great law firm that allowed me to come kind of park at their firm the first few months out of law school and my first few months practicing, um, just to give me some some basis and understanding of how to practice in natural resources and energy. I'll always be grateful for them giving me a chance to kind of get my feet wet and the guidance that they gave me. And um, and I had a part a law partner for a while who was really instrumental in in <clears throat> just teaching me some of the just practical aspects of law. How do you draft a contract? <laughs> they actually don't teach you that in law school. <laughs> they teach you about contract law, but nobody ever teaches you how to draft a contract. So, you know, I had some really great influences in my life, and I will be grateful to them for that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it is interesting when you have the actual notion of what you think you're going to do, mm-hmm. and then you wake up and you go, uh, that's a little different than what I'm actually doing. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. For you. <laughs> You know, if, if you were to put an ad on on local paper, and a shout out to the paper that you like to use up in Wyoming is what? Oh, we, the Fence Post. The Fence Post. We so, love the Fence Post, yep. <laughs> so if you were going to put an ad on the front page uh-huh. of the Fence Post, yep. what would it say and why? 
Well, we do put ads inside the fence post. All right. Um, And it really, I think our message is, you know, we're going to help you with whatever legal issues you've got. We're here to put a plan together. We are here to take a look to see what the best options are for you and give you those recommendations and then implement that, walk through that with you. You're not alone. When you've got us on your side, you don't have to worry about things because you know we're there working hard for you. We've got your back. That's a good front page. (laughs) So for you, looking back over the past few years, is there a belief or protocol that you've put in place inside your firm that's allowed you to grow to this point that maybe you didn't have when you first started? Oh, that's a hard question. You know, when I first started the firm, my perspective was family first and everything else second. As the firm has grown, and as our client base has grown, and uh, and you know now we're managing staff and other attorneys, um, I think my focus has really been take care of our clients, take care of everyone in our firm, treat everyone with respect and kindness, and I think those are the the things that have really kind of come out that are really important for us now. Extended family. Yeah, it is. It's an extended family. We're you know we're here to take care of each other. You know, if you were, let's say, there's either a a, an attorney that's just graduating and they got their legal schooling done and they've tested and passed the bar mm-hmm. and they're ready to go or you have an attorney go you know I don't I like the law I don't appreciate my life right now mm-hmm. what advice might you offer to those attorneys out there that are either just passing the bar or would like to take and emulate what you're doing so I think the first thing that they need to do is decide what they want out of life they need, to, they need to design what they want their life to look like first. And uh, I think that's, I think that people are just so focused on getting that job, getting that first job or getting a job to put food on the table that sometimes they, they forget to think about what they want their life to look like and how they want to enjoy their lives. I get a lot of attorneys who call me and say, Crystal, I'm, I'm stuck. I've been doing this for a long time. I'm burned out. I, don't, yeah, how do, I love the law. I want to keep doing the law, but I can't keep doing it the same way. And so for those attorneys, I first thing I tell them is, well, what do you want out of life? What's your dream? What's your dream? I had one person tell me, uh, I would love to be able to travel Europe and just, you know, go visit all the historic places, but still be a lawyer and still practice. So, okay, let's design that. In fact, I met a really fascinating woman on our hiking lawyers yesterday. Uh, we went and hiked up in Rocky Mountain National Park, and she's a Social Security appeals attorney, and she lives in Morocco. Cool lady, cool attorney. She's smart, and she's she decided her her and her husband decided they wanted to raise their kids in Morocco, and they wanted to experience another culture. And their kids are growing up learning three languages, and you know it's it's cool. And they, and they live on the beach. And they live on the beach. And so, it, you know, you can do it. So what is it that you want? What's your dream? What do you want? Design your life around that. For students who are coming out of law school, I say find a mentor who's doing what you want to do and living their life the way you want to live your life. Find that mentor and then learn from them how to emulate that and do that. What was I going to ask you? It was on my mind. Social media. Oh. That's a good question. So how do folks find you on social media? So we are on LinkedIn. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and I've learned we're on Pinterest now. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but you can find us on our website, www.mcdonaughlawllc.com. And it's M-C-D-O-N-O-U-G-H. Yes, mcdonaughlawllc.com. Super. Well, Crystal, you know, we get along really well. We've talked a lot mm-hmm. off show, and, and so I, I really appreciate all that you do, and, and, you know, in particular, you know, the focus that your family has on your children and trying to educate them as well as, you know, demonstrate by example. Mm-hmm. So uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to be on the show. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Mm-hmm.